And welcome back to the show, everyone. My name is Brian Elam. I will be your host here on Get Your Entrepreneurship Together. And today, we're going to talk about content. And not just specifically content, but good content. How to create it, how to get it to convert, and why it is so important for you to have content that converts. And to do that, we have a copywriter here that has made it his business to help business owners improve their copy, save their blogs, their email lists. His name is John Clements. And John, thank you so much for hopping on. It is an honor to have you here. You bet, Brian. Thanks so much for having me. 100%. So I usually like to start at the beginning with people because nobody decides you know, right out of the womb to uh, be what they are or what they become typically. So just a little bit of fun, a little bit of background. What did you want to be when you were a kid? We all wanted to be something. Like I wanted to, uh, I wanted to be a, a Navy pilot as soon as I saw Top Gun, but obviously that didn't end up working out. How about you? What did you want to be? You know, at the, when I was in elementary school, I wanted to be an NBA player, and I am five foot nine and three quarters, and I was very skinny at the time, still am. So that just, yeah, that didn't work either. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. Do you still play? No, I don't. No, I actually transitioned to running. So I actually did run cross country and track for many years, junior high, high school, college, post-collegiate. So I was able to sort of realize that athletic dream, but in a different way. Interesting. So what was the, I, I'm not familiar, obviously with that world. I'm not uh, an athlete in, in sports. I was a band geek in high school and, and on but uh, how did post-collegiate running work? Was that something like, were you trying to get into the Olympics or, or what was going on there? You know, I suppose my ultimate goal, I wasn't good enough. I was never good enough to get to the Olympics. That was not going to happen. But there was just this very small chance that I might be able to qualify for the Olympic trials in the marathon specifically. And I never really got very close to that. But that was kind of the driving thing. Like maybe I could just sort of squeeze in, but uh, it didn't work out. But I still had tons of fun doing it. That's what it's all about, man. Having fun, doing what you like to do and having fun. We, we connected just a little bit before we hit the record button about another thing we do. We both play music, love rock and roll. So yeah, it's all about having fun. Um, okay. So obviously the basketball thing didn't work out. Uh, the track thing didn't carry you as far as you thought it, it might. Um, how did you start to find your love of writing? Like when did that start to develop? Yeah. For you? I've always kind of been a word geek, and I just kind of own that. Um, I was the guy in high school English class that enjoyed Shakespeare and couldn't wait to read Romeo and Juliet. You know, all the other kids are like, this is, why are we doing this? This is stupid. I really liked it. Uh, I had a high school English teacher in my senior year who was super uh, focused on grammar rules and spelling and all that, and I just ate that stuff up. So I never considered it a career till a little bit later, which we can talk about, but I think I've always had that natural bent. Yep. Totally understand. We all, we all have our gifts, our innate things that we love to pay attention to, whether it's, you know, music or wordsmithing or what have you. So that teacher that you're talking about that really focused in on, on more of the mechanics behind um, how to put the language together. Um, was that something that you were interested in? already because of your love of reading and you were like why does this make sense why does this sound so good that's a great question i think that maybe subconsciously perhaps but i didn't really realize that until that particular class that hey this is grammar stuff i'm actually pretty good at this and i enjoy it and i love you know finding mistakes and correcting them which is i know kind of a weird thing to love but i don't know i guess i'm a weird guy I, again i own it it's cool i'm, I'm good with it See, I think that was, you know, one of those steps along the way to get me where I am today, for sure. Absolutely. So are you one of those people that corrects people on uh, on Twitter with uh, your, with the apostrophe R-E? <laughs> I don't do that. You know, if I'm not getting paid, I don't do it, I, you know, because it's my job now. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I just, I've mellowed out also over the years where I'm okay with that kind of stuff because I understand that, you know, if you're just tweeting about something in your personal life, it doesn't matter. Business is a different thing. It's a very different thing, but just personal life, I'm not going to get, you know, wrapped around the axle. 
Yeah. Well, good on you for not being one of those grammar police people online. We got we got enough of them, even, even though it irks me, too. I'm just like, ah, I'm not I'm just going to let it go. Let it go. You know, I because especially because I know the people that are doing it and they're good people. They're just uh, they're in a hurry. You know, they're in a hurry. That's right. <laughs> Well, talking about, you know, business and putting things together for businesses, how did that tend to come about for you? Did, like, was it a, was it a natural development through a career that you had started out in or what's that story? No, I actually got started during COVID. So I actually spent 15 years in the corporate world and the first 10, I enjoyed it. And the last five, I just, I couldn't stand it. I hated it. I hated my, my job. I hated driving into work. I hated all of it. But I basically was too scared to take action because I have a family I have to provide. I have to have a job. And I thought, I'm just stuck in this dead-end career that I hate and I can't do anything about it. So thankfully, I got a push from COVID because you might remember there were some economic downturns around that time. Oh, and just a little bit. Just a few. <laughs> and I lost my job because of them. I basically, my employer couldn't pay me anymore. So rather than go back in the corporate world, which I hated, uh, I said, okay, what can I actually, like, this is a gift. I, this is an opportunity. So how can I use this to do something that I love that is also valuable and people will pay me for? And so I thought back to, you know, proofreading, editing, writing. I thought, well, I enjoy that stuff. I've always been good at it. Maybe people will pay me to do that. So I went down that road and I found out, yes, people will pay you to do that. That's a valuable service. And so that's how I got my start. It's 2021. I started on Upwork you know, 10 bucks an hour, just doing the most basic of proofreading tasks. And I just slowly grew and grew and grew, added more clients, started doing more things and uh, built it up into, into where we're at right now. Awesome, man. And I want to go back just a little bit more into the mindset of things, because you, you mentioned when you were at those last five years of your career there that you just really weren't enjoying it. It wasn't lighting you up and, and you use the word hate, which is a very strong word. And for someone that works with words uh, for a living, I don't take that lightly coming from you, but there was still that fear there in making the transition. And I agree with you that COVID, though it was a terrible situation for many, it was also, there's, there's no dark without the light. It was also a gift for a lot of people as well. That time apart, that time at home, what have you. Did you find that that unintended gift helped to unlock this idea in your mind that you couldn't do it or you shouldn't do it because you had the family, you had the responsibilities? Did you did you consciously have that mindset shift after COVID hit? I did. I and you're right. Hate is a strong word, and I mean it. And that. And by the way, that I loved everyone I worked with. I, I've never, you know, all the people in my past have been wonderful people. But it's just, it just didn't align with my values or the way that I want to conduct myself any anymore. So that's what I mean by that. Uh, the situation, not the people. So right. in COVID, I'm unemployed and, you know, I, I said to myself, okay, I'm going to try something else, anything else. Like I will, there's a Safeway by my house. I will go stock the shelves of Safeway overnight if I have to. Like that's where I was at. And so going back to the corporate world, I call it my plan F. If everything else fails, that's what I'll do. <laughs> so it became... I, I kind of switched my the way I used fear. At, for, for all those years, it was a fear of trying something new. And then after COVID happened, and even to this day, it's the fear of having to go back to that world that I don't want to be a part of anymore. So a lot of it really involved me learning how to use that fear to my advantage. Yeah, that's a very interesting, that's a very interesting point. Um, do you still use that fear to this day or has it shifted into the love of what you do? I love what I do, but also as an entrepreneur, and you know this, anytime you take that next growth step, there is fear involved. You know, I, before I started going on podcasts, I was afraid because I've never been on one. What do you do? What do you say? How do you, how does this work? But in those times I go back and I remember how much I didn't like you know, driving to work every day and sitting in a cubicle. And I definitely use that to say, okay, this fear, I can overcome this because the alternative is going back to the way things were. And I, I will not go back to the way things were. 
Hmm. And do you find that that fear has, it's still there, obviously, and I 100% agree with you, but do you find that it's lessened now as you take those next steps forward because you already have the past experience of, oh, I was scared of this, you know, doing this writing thing at the beginning, but I made it so I can do it. So did you find that lessens that fear a little bit? It does lessen it. And actually, it's kind of a weird thing. Yes, the more you face your fears, the, the smaller those fears tend to get. But also, the more times you try something and fail, and I've got plenty of failures in my life, the more you realize that it's okay. Like your wife still loves you. Your friends are still your friends. And no one thinks any less of you for trying something and, and, and having it not work out. So yeah, there's a couple different reasons why I think that fear lessens over time because you realize it's just not as big as you think. And I also, I just read uh, that book, uh, The 10X Rule, I think, by Grant Cardone. And he mentions that whatever it is in your in your growth uh, that you're afraid of, that's a very strong signal that you need to do that thing right now. And so I've started thinking about it from that approach too. So the, all those things kind of, yeah, they do help to minimize that fear. It's always there, but it becomes more of a tool or, or even an ally in some cases. Yeah, that's right. And it's a good point that you uh, that you made from from Grant's book there, and it's it's very true, because you can't sit there and worry about what might be or what might happen if you're too busy taking action. So that's a very good point that you brought up there. Thank you for sharing that quote. Appreciate that. Yeah, you bet. So in thinking about you know taking action and helping business owners, obviously want to get into helping them write content because it is so important to get your views across, to create that authority, create that trust. So in your mind, what is the secret that makes good content convert? Yeah. You know, I think there's actually, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of give you the secret sauce. Okay. Uh, there's three things that I think make for good content. So you can apply this. I'm going to speak in the context of writing a blog post for your business, but these same things can apply to a, a social media post or a newsletter or an email. So let me give you three things right now and your listeners that you can do to really start writing good content. So the first thing is write good introductions. So you can find stats on this all over the internet that say you have anywhere from just a few milliseconds to about eight seconds to capture someone's attention. So what does that mean for you in a, in a context like this? It means you need to have something in the first sentence or two that really connects and resonates with the person reading that. It could be a statistic that they don't know. It could be a personal story or anecdote. Uh, it could be a controversial statement, something to kind of get the reader to dig their teeth into what you're having, what you're trying to say. So strong interest to hook the reader is, is number one. Number two, if you have lengthier content, use headers to show where you're going. And the reason this is so important is because most of us, something like 84% of us, don't read an article word for word, at least at first. We scan it, right? We go down, we flip through, we say, what is this going to say? Does this matter to me? Do I care? So use that to your advantage. Have headers, break your text into chunks, and use those headers to give people the highlights of what you're trying to say. And then that will draw them in to go back and read a little more closely. And then finally especially if you want to convert, you need to have a strong call to action at the end of your uh, blog post, email, social media post, or whatever. And the reason for that is, here's something else I've learned and people don't think about. None of us has ESP. I can't look into your brain and know what it is you want me to do next. But if you're a business owner and you've written this blog post, let's say, there's something you want this person to do. Maybe you want them to read another article. Maybe you want them to sign up for a newsletter. Maybe you want them to schedule a phone call with you. You need to tell us because we don't know. Don't just assume that we're going to figure it out on our own because you know, we're not. So those are the three things that if you can start doing those things, even just those three, you're going to put yourself ahead of so many other people in the marketplace. So rewrite your intros or write better intros to hook the reader. Use those headers to show the flow of where you're going and include that strong call to action. So that's, you know, that's my gift to you and your listeners of just how to start making traffic that or, or blogs that, that convert, that, that bring that traffic, that get that reader down that customer journey. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for that. I know that's going to help out a lot of people. Um, now, 
in thinking about the intro, that first hook and the call to action, I'm wondering if in your mind, there ought to be a correlation between those two, as in the call to action somehow answers or addresses that hook. What, what would you say to that? I think that's a best practice for sure. I try to do that in my own writing. I don't know if it's 100% always has to be the case, but I think if you want to, yeah, be among the upper echelon, I think that is definitely something you should do because it just ties a nice bow on it. It brings it back around full circle and it just provides a better reader experience. So yeah, I actually agree with that. Awesome. Very good. Then what in your mind now, what would be, or in your experience rather, what would be the biggest or, or the most common mistake that you find when you go into a blog and start the rescue? I will say, I will answer it this way. The most common mistake I'm seeing right now, just in on the online in general, is using AI to write your content for you and thinking that you're going to get results. So I would guess that maybe 30 to 40%, this is not a scientific thing, this is just my gut feel, of people with blogs are using AI not just to give them ideas or help them out or, or get them unstuck, but to just write the whole piece for them. And the problem with that is AI content is designed to be middle of the road, which means it doesn't resonate. It doesn't ever say anything controversial. It doesn't ever put two new ideas together in a new way. It gives you nothing to sink your teeth into as a reader. And so therefore I can't, you know, who's going to read it? Like I, I back out immediately when I see AI written content because it's, I just know it's going to be a slog fest. So just in general, I think a lot of people right now are exploring how to use AI and some of them are maybe using it for things that's not designed to be used for. So that's, that's really the biggest mistake just on broad terms that I see. Okay. Yeah, that's definitely a valid point. And I 100% wanted to get into this with you. So given what you said and this new exploration of AI, obviously we now know it's not a good idea to let it write the entire content piece for you, but how would it be best to utilize AI in order to, you know, speed up your workflow, get some ideas, things like that, but yet not lose your personal voice, your personal touch? Yeah, AI is great for a number of things, and I use it every day. So I'm not, you know, I'm not poo-pooing AI. I'm just saying stop using it whole cloth if you want to get results. So what can you use it for? Yeah, brainstorming is a wonderful uh, application for AI. Uh, hey, I, you know, I own a business, and we do. I, I, may, I sell supplies for pet owners. Hey, AI, give me twenty ideas for a blog posts I could write. And it'll spit out 20 ideas and five of them will be pretty good. Two of them will be amazing and the others will be, you know, okay, throw away. So that's a great use for it. Um, another thing you can have it do is you can tell that, okay, here's my blog post idea. Can you give me an outline? And it'll give you an outline. And again, some of the outline will be wonderful. You can adopt it. Others, other parts of it, you can just discard and that's okay. So it's great in that way as well to kind of speed up that process. It can also take you from a blank page to something, which is often the, the hardest thing to do as a writer, right? You're staring at that blank screen going, what do I write about? Well, it's fine to use AI to get you from zero to something on the page that you can then go back in and, and make edits and make changes, start to put your personality into your stories. So it does all of these things super well, and it can make your writing more efficient uh, and, and get you down the road quicker and faster and better. Um, it's just when you start to over torque on it and you just start to let it, you, you know, like I say, don't ever outsource your thinking to AI, please. <laughs> like, don't do that. Very good point. And going back, and this might be a more um, grammatical, technical question, but in, in using AI to load your already written blog post into and have it produce an outline. Uh, I was just, that kind of struck me a little bit funny. It's like, if you've already got this blog post created, why would you need an outline? What would be the advantage of doing that? Oh thing? yeah. Okay. So I must've misspoke. So um, what I should have said is if you have a blog post idea, like a title or, or a subject or a couple of key points you want to hit, go to AI, give it that information and say, will you, 
produce an outline for me, and then I can write my blog post from there. So I think I probably just said that wrong. Yeah, yeah, it kind of got reversed <laughs> there a little bit. Probably it was like, hmm, maybe that's maybe that's a hack to find out another subject line or that you could have uh, incorporated into the blog post. Maybe yeah. I don't know. I, I guess you know you could you guys could try it if you want. You know, yeah. load your I load will. your blog post and have it produce an outline. See if you missed anything. Yeah, I will tell. Here's one thing though that I will tell you that does I think work pretty well. Let's say you have a completely written blog post. And you want to make some uh, YouTube shorts or some Instagram reels or po post some other you know visual content. Use that blog post to do that, and AI might be able to spit out a pretty good reel. I haven't tried that specifically, but you know if you give it your blog post, it might spit out a, a real uh, transcript that you can modify. That's something I'll need to look into, but that that might be an application. Oh, you mean like taking like a piece of your blog post and and doing like a, a text to video? interpretation? Yeah, you can do something like that. Um, a lot of people ask me, you know, with the rise of a of, of visual content, a visual, you know, medium, does that mean like blogging is dead? And I say no. I say written content is the foundation of what you offer. And then take that content and use it to make YouTube videos, use it to make YouTube uh, shorts, use it to go put a 60 second clip of you speaking on LinkedIn. There's no law that says you can't do both. So why not do both? And the interesting part of the exploration is, can AI help you with that? And I believe it can. I, I haven't like dove into that, but I think there's probably an application there. Yeah, I would imagine like as we get more in depth with this whole AI revolution that we're experiencing, that the the opportunities and the possibilities are just going to explode beyond what we could even think is possible right now. And yeah, it, it's going to be interesting to see what kind of content gets picked up by the the algorithms going forward and and pushed and it's interesting you say that the written content well it's not interesting it's kind of predictable given your job but that written <laughs> content's the foundation of what you do and you can create the videos after because there's a lot of people that are the complete reverse like you create your videos first and then just transcribe to produce yes. <laughs> your your blogs and things do you think that that's a a good idea because i mean obviously it's a video that you created, it's your voice, your image that made it happen. So it's not like you're, you know, having AI write your content all vanilla for you. So do you think that's a good idea to utilize video in that way? So I think it can be a great idea with one caveat, and that is the way that we speak and the way that we write is not identical. So if you were to just take a transcript of something and put it on a website, it's going to read like a transcript of a video. So a better idea would be to take your transcript, hire someone like me to go and smooth it out and make it applicable for a written context, preserve your voice. You know, that's super important, but just, you know, you we maybe organize it slightly differently or take out all of the ums and you knows and, and things that we naturally add in. Sure. Uh, and just, you know, make, just, just make it appropriate for a written context. Like that's totally doable. So I totally agree with you. That's a that's a wonderful strategy. Just make sure you bring in someone in the loop like me or someone else who can ensure that that transition is smooth and it makes sense. You know, the end product makes sense. Hmm. So besides, you've got my curiosity going now. So besides <laughs> the the ums and the o's and all of those types of things that we you would take out to make it more readable and digestible. What are the other things that would be tweaked between having a video transcript versus a written piece of content? Yeah, sentence structure is a big one. So oftentimes we will start talking about one subject and then in the middle of it, we'll pause and kind of talk about something else because it entered into our, into our mind. Uh, so there's that. I see that a lot in like transcripts. You might use uh, certain slang words or jargon that makes sense in a, in a in a conversation that wouldn't make sense in a written context. Uh, and there might be something in your visual presentation that explains some concept in a way that your transcript doesn't, and you would have to include that. So, you know, those are some of the changes, but just to the bottom line, like I said, we just don't talk like we write. And there's a way to write in a conversational way, but it's, but it's not the same as having a conversation. Very interesting, very interesting. And just another reason to have good people in your network, you know, like yourself, 
that you can take those content pieces too and be like, here, this was a video, make it, make it a blog piece, make it an email letter, you know, what have you. Yeah. Super, super important. And so going back to the blogging, I, I was wondering, will optimizing a blog, will that increase someone's SEO to make it more searchable and findable? It absolutely will. So let me give you some stats. A um, couple of examples. So HubSpot, we all know HubSpot. They went back and optimized their old blog posts, and they found that uh, they got an, an average of 106% more organic search views than they had before. Uh, and a company called Databox did the same thing. They took 24-old blog posts. They optimized them. They saw a 75% increase in website traffic. I've actually optimized my own blog post in the past month or two, and I've also seen a 76% increase in organic traffic. So the, the steps that you can take to do that, and we can talk about what some of those are because there are some specific things you can do, will absolutely affect your SEO. They'll help with reader retention. They'll help with, uh, with click-through rates and conversion rates. So yeah, absolutely. There's a ton of value in going back and optimizing what you wrote two, three, four years ago. Now, does it just stem from rewriting the post with those, you know, those kind of three key points that you mentioned earlier, or do you have to, you know, be a tech guy and, or girl and, and get real behind the scenes under the hood and like metadata and all this type of stuff? Yeah, a lot of it. So the three, th the three things I gave you are part of that process that, that I actually do for people. Uh, there's other things, but I'll, I'll, I mean, most of it, 90% of it is just going and rewriting that content. We, like we don't really get into the real technical SEO stuff with this. We get into it just a little bit, um, but even that is enough to push you over the edge and get you those results. That's so, that's so interesting. And honestly, it's really encouraging to hear that that you don't have to focus on the tech side for 90% of what you do. You just need to optimize and rewrite the article to make it more scannable, readable, sticky, all those kinds of things. That's, that's awesome news, man. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. And the, really the reason why is because if you look at Google and what they're actually trying to do when they display search results, it all comes back to quality. If you have a quality article, video, whatever, YouTube is going to prioritize that. And so if you can just figure out what they mean by that word quality and do those things, then that is going to increase your chances of, of getting, you know, higher up in the search results. Yeah. Yep. hundred percent. And speaking of quality, um, trust and authority when it comes to being an entrepreneur, when it comes to running a business, trust and authority between your business and the customer is huge. There's no conversions that happen without that. So how can good copy encourage that kind of trust and authority build leading to a conversion? And can you give potentially an example of a good sentence or two that would do that? So I think, uh, so there's, I'll, I'll answer this in a couple of different ways. So first of all, just from a purely like grammar and spelling perspective, studies have actually shown that 59% of surveyed buyers, if they find grammar and, and spelling mistakes on, on like an e-commerce website, they won't buy from that website. So here's how I like to think about it. You, you've got 60% of the people out there that if your copy isn't clean, you're putting a roadblock in their way. And you don't need to have that roadblock in there. Like, why are you putting that there? There are people like me who can help you with that. So, you know, just from a purely like grammar geek perspective, there's value in having correct grammar and spelling and punctuation. And it can be, you know, uh, uh, thought of in like a dollar amount, actually. So that's kind of crazy. A lot of people don't think about that. Um, and as far as qual as far as like authority and trust, what I'll say is, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're a business owner, you are the expert at what you sell. And I know that you have a quality product and I know that you are amazing and that you provide incredible value to your customers. The question is, how can someone like me come in and help you get that across? And so I don't, I can't think of a sentence or two to do that, but I can think of 
a lot of things that will help in that. And so, you know, correct spelling and grammar, uh, having those optimized articles like we talked about, um, ensuring that your call to action is relevant and to a product that you currently sell or offer is another key one. Um, another piece, if you go the AI route, is whatever you do with AI, fact check it, please. Because AI literally does not understand the concept of truth or error. It just spits out what is probably the next word according to whatever you know thought processes it might have. So you can't trust what AI gives you. You have to verify. In fact, a couple of weeks ago, I, I think this is like on the big time news, right? Uh, Google AI reported that if you want to make a better pizza, you needed to put super glue you know, in with the cheese to make it stickier. <laughs> it didn't know that that was wrong or unsafe. It's just it, and they found out that was because uh, that particular AI engine had uh, consumed all of Reddit's data. And so someone was making a sarcastic post about that and included that fact sarcastically. AI doesn't know what sarcasm is, right? <laughs> so, you know, to answer your question, I guess it's kind of long-winded, but everything, like basically your content online serves as a proxy for your product because I can't see or feel or touch your product. So I have to rely on the quality of your content to kind of make that, make that jump for me in my own mind. That, that is great insight. I really appreciate the fact that you said that as a consumer, you can't see, feel, or touch the product. That is so important when it comes to the customer experience and the key word right there is experience. So if you can find a way as a business owner to have your customer have an experience with your product or your service without being in the room with it or without being there with you physically, that is an incredibly powerful way to get more business and more clients. Would you agree? I would 100% agree with that. And again, it just comes back to the quality of your content. Is it written well? Uh, does it answer the question that the consumer has about the product? Does it solve their problem? Um, you know, are, are you presenting it in the best light? Like all these things, they they make that and that that experience for the customer. Yeah, 100%. Mm. Do you find that incorporating stories into the content helps that process? I do. You know, I was thinking about this. We we have been telling stories as a species for as long as we have been able to talk. So, you know, 30,000 years ago, sitting around the campfire, we were telling stories. So that's deeply ingrained in our DNA. And so, and if you I'm just, just do, the, do this test. Next time you're out on the internet and you're reading something, just think about what catches your eye. It's probably a story. It's probably, or it could be maybe a picture of a face. That's another one that we all tend to, to gravitate toward. But you're going to get invested emotionally in a story way more than you're going to get invested emotionally in like, uh, you know, the, the text of a, the, of a product or the, the, the uh, technical specifications of a product, right? So yeah, anytime you can include a story, especially in your introductions, the better off you're going to be. Mm -hmm. So in thinking about that, and going back to the very first tip you gave about that hook, would it be a good idea then to have that hook be the the intro or or some attention grabbing piece to a story that's in the very next paragraph? Yeah, you could completely do that. Another thing you could do that would work maybe even better is if you can find a way to tell a story that relates to the subject or your product or whatever. And if you can find a way to start in the middle of that story at the climax, then people are going to go, oh my gosh, what's going on? I have to read this to find out, you know, what happened or, or why this happened. So that would be an, that would be like a super amazing way to go about it. Oh, very interesting. I like that. And then would you, would you do like a, a flashback at the, maybe the next paragraph or a couple of paragraphs down so they get the whole story? Or would that be like maybe the next blog post or something? Like, how would you structure that? Oh man. Well, I guess if you're doing a series of blog posts, you could do it in the next one. That would be pretty cool. Cause then you would give that reader that reason to keep reading. So that'd be a pretty cool thing to do. Um, or you could, you could, yeah, do the flashback method. You could tell parts of your story throughout the article and each section 
do a, do a different part of it. You can circle back to it, you know, at the call to action. There's a lot of ways you can do it. Uh, so I don't think there's one right way, but yeah, any of those ways could potentially work. Okay. Yeah. And yet another reason to hire someone like you and your firm in order to help an entrepreneur put that together. So they make sure there's cohesion, that there's flow. And uh, again, it helps increase that authority, trust, and uh, that stickiness. So they come back. Very good. Man, John, this has been incredible. So guys, say thank you. Say thank you in the comments to John, because this has been amazing. And he's given so many tips and gold nuggets. So just rewatch this entire episode if you need to, because there's a lot of good stuff in there. And again, John, thank you so much for being here. Where can people find you, connect with you and uh, hire you? Because man, we need this out there. Yeah. So again, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Um, thanks to everyone who's listening. I deeply appreciate it. So if you want to get a hold of me, there's a couple of ways. The easiest way is to go to my website. You can go to cedarpressproofreading.com. And what you'll find is there's, you know, I've got blog posts. I have different, different, you know, things you can take from there. You can book a call with me if you want. And we'll just have a conversation just like I'm having with Brian. Super low key. Just, hey, what do you got? What do you need help with? Can I help you? Um, so that's a way to do it. And then if you want to get with me on LinkedIn, I'm over there too. So LinkedIn, you can search for John Clements or Cedar Press Proofreading. You can connect with me over there and we'd have the same conversation. Awesome. Awesome. Well, those links are going to be below. And then John, you also gave me another link to basically a self-assessment tool, I believe. So you can start taking a look at your own blog without having John there, but with more of these amazing tips. And so I will leave that link down there below as well as a free gift for you all to check out and have to get this process started. Thank you so much again, John, for coming on. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Just, yeah, amazing stuff. Thank you so much. My pleasure. All right, guys, you know what to do. Like this video, share this video out. You never know whose life you can positively impact with just a simple share of a video. And peace. I'll see you in the next one.